Tarihsel kritik metodu İslam geleneğine nasıl uygulanabilir? Well, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Javad T. Hashmi. I am I initially trained as a physician. I uh, went back to the university for the last decade. Uh, I'm now at the tail end of my PhD at Harvard University in Islamic Studies. Um, and where I'm researching my dissertation is on the topic of jihad, um, but I'm approaching this topic uh, through the historical critical method. And so what I'm here to talk about today is the historical critical method um, and how it applies to the Islamic tradition. So uh, first, the question is, what is the historical critical method? The first thing I would say is that um, the historical critical method is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, each of the terms, historical, critical, and method, are not quite appropriate. For example, the word historical, well, it may not just be his history that we're talking about, where we do deal with, for example, the Bible and these kind of texts in a literary way. Um, and we're actually looking at issues internal to the text. So it's not just the work of a historian. It's more of textual scholarship. Um, as far as the word critical and historical critical method, that seems to imply some sort of negativity um, that we're being, you know, I'm being very critical about the text. But that's not really what's meant by the term critical. It doesn't necessarily mean a positive or negative view towards the text. It just means that we are not um, taking the traditional or orthodox opinions without a grain of salt. Um, and so that's what it means to engage critically. And finally, it's not really a method. It's more of an attitude or uh, an approach to the texts. Um, so that's the key point, that it's more of an attitude and approach. And this is an attitude and approach that I think Muslims should actually embrace when it comes to the Quran and the traditional Islamic sources, including, for example, the Hadith. Uh, this is a little bit controversial. Uh, many Muslims, including some Muslims in the uh, academic world, are trying to push back against the historical critical method, but I think that's a bit misguided. So before I go even any further, I could say that I kind of ascertain a few different responses when it comes to the historical critical method. Uh, amongst Muslims. Uh, the first is just to ignore it. I think that's the dominant kind of trend because people haven't heard what is this historical critical method. So it's just, uh, you know, for the common average Muslim on the street, they they have no awareness of it and it's easy then to ignore it. And I think uh, it's easy for even some scholars who operate, you know, who study, for example, Islamic law in the 14th century, well, they can ignore the historical critical method since they're not dealing with the early period of Islam or the Quran as a text itself. Um, the second approach is to reject the historical critical method. And there are some Muslims who are either in the academy or kind of adjacent to the academy who will take on this approach, which is to reject and push back against the historical critical method and to say that it's just a Western construct. It's even got a neo-colonial agenda to it, and therefore it's very problematic and we should just reject it entirely. So I think that's a very common response to the historical critical method. The third kind of uh, response that I see to the historical critical method is what I call belittling or saying, well, there's nothing new here. That is to say, uh, these Western scholars, they're just reading the books of our own classical scholars and rediscovering things. And our scholars already said this a long time ago. So what's the big deal? What's new? I think this is a little bit misleading because even though these uh, historical scholars are looking to see what earlier Islamic scholars said, they're reaching different conclusions than these uh, scholars of the past. And so I think it's important to uh, take that into consideration. Then there is the fourth kind of response, which I see very commonly amongst even some of my students, um, is to compartmentalize. That is to say, when you go to the mosque, then you follow traditional Islam. You know, you believe all the traditional or traditionalist ideas, uh, maybe even in your day-to-day -day life you do. And then when you operate in the academy, you write an article for a journal, then you all of a sudden switch modes and you write um, in an academic way, you, you take a historical critical approach. So this is what's you know called compartmentalization. Um, I don't know how people do this. Uh, for me, I think this causes a lot of cognitive dissonance. I'd rather be kind of unified as one individual as opposed to operating on two different tracks, which I think in some ways can be mutually exclusive.
And so that leads us to the fifth and final response, which is the one that I am advocating, which is to accept the historical critical method. And by I mean accept, I mean fully accept and embrace the historical critical method. Um, and I think Muslims, uh, believing Muslims can and should do that since we believe in the Prophet Muhammad, we believe in the Quran, and we want to know what the Prophet actually said or did. And I think the historical critical method is the best uh, method that we have in order to determine that. And so I don't think we should be fearful of those results, but instead we should embrace them. Now, granted, it is admittedly a, um, it's it's a little bit of a scary uh, concept of going back and seeing what did he actually say and do? Does it differ from, uh, you know, what things we've grown up with? But I think if you really do believe in the prophet that he existed, I mean, the way I think about it is if I had a time machine and I could go back in the past, in the time of the prophet and see what he actually said or did, would I want to do that? I think so. Yes. And I think if I was too fearful to do that, it would actually show a lack of faith on my part that I don't really believe in the prophet and what he brought. Um, so I think from that perspective, the historical critical method is similar to this analogy. Now, of course, we don't actually know what happened in the past through the historical crit critical method. All we can say is an approximation of what we think most likely happened. So that's an important caveat. Finally, I would say that this uh, fifth and final um, approach of accepting also involves a level of uh, co-optation. That is um, to say, we are co-opting uh, the Western historical critical method because we can actually push back in some ways and say that if the historical critical method is used consistently, then we will see that um, some of the conclusions that Western scholars have reached, for example, on the issue of jihad, we can actually use the historical cr critical method and show that it will actually go to our favor and push back against certain Orientalist tropes that are used against Islam. And so that's where a lot of the work that I do come in comes in. And from that perspective, I kind of get pushed back from Western um, secular historians or scholars, and I also get pushed back from more traditionalist Muslims. And that's something that I'm perfectly comfortable and happy with. So ultimately, I'm arguing for something called uh, Islamic academic theology. Um, and I'm not using theology in the kind of narrow sense of kalam here, but rather I'm saying academic theology in the sense of we're taking the uh, critical insights from the Western historical critical approach, and we're applying them to faith and seeing what is the result if we do that? Um, and I think that's already going on in Turkey. That's what I've heard. I'm not very familiar with the scene in Turkey just because I don't speak the language. And I really do hope from learning from all of you about what is going on there. But I think that's quite exciting if that's the case. I would say that when it comes to the West, uh, I feel there's only a handful of us Muslim academics who are pushing for this. And I think I'm one of the only ones who is doing that in a public way. I know in Private, we do talk about this, um, but as far as actually publicly advocating for it, uh, I think I'm a, in a very small minority, but it's an increasing trend within the academy itself. It's just something that we haven't really talked about publicly. So that is in a nutshell what I am arguing. Uh, now, what is the historical critical method? I could get into that in a little bit more detail. Basically, um, it's a refusal. Well, it's many different things, but I will say here are some important bullet points. First of all, it's a refusal to simply take what orthodoxy or what the church, or in this case, our ulama say um, what happened in the past. It's being skeptical or critical of what they say and not simply taking it for granted. And so we want to know what does the text mean in its original context? And in order to do that, I'm sorry, just one second. All right. Um, so, sorry about that. I apologize. Um, so. It is a little skepticism or caution when it comes to orthodox or traditional narratives, which are back projected into the past. Uh, it's also different from a harmonizing or reconciling approach. So, for example, when it comes to the Bible, uh, we know that the Bible was composed by different authors uh, over uh, you know, a long period of time. So we shouldn't necessarily reconcile one text with another or harmonize them. For example, the Gospels, we don't harmonize all of the discrepancies between the four Gospels since they were written by different authors. Instead, we try to understand each for what they are saying at that particular moment um, and understanding that there might be a divergence. So the historical critical method treated the Bible as a human work. Now, this is the most controversial part because 
as believers, believers take their texts as being inspired by God. It's still cons- it's still possible to take the historical critical approach and hold the view that a work is inspired by God. And I do believe that the Quran is a text inspired by God in some way. It's divinely inspired. Um, but on the other hand, it is difficult to take the historical critical approach and also embrace, I think, the uber orthodox opinion, the Hanbali opinion of the Quran being the pre-eternal, uncreated word of God. That do- you do run into certain problems if you take that approach, um, because the Quran is dealing with um, certain ideas that were prevalent in the milieu in which it was revealed. Um, from that standpoint, Western scholars talk about sources of inspiration. Uh, you run into problems if you take that kind of what I call uber orthodox view of the Quran. And that's why scholars like Fazl Rahman, who I'm sure your viewers are familiar with, argued that uh, the the way that inspiration worked was that um, the prophet was inspired in his subconscious and this kind of bubbled up into his conscious. And that's what we know as the Quran, but that there is that imprint of the prophet's mind on the text in that way. So it's in the one sense, it is inspired by God, but there is kind of the prophet's own subconscious there. So there is an element of the prophet's mind as well. Uh, that he got, he ran into trouble for that, um, and he was kicked out of Pakistan because of that. But I think the reason why he reached that conclusion is precisely because he was seeing where historical critical scholarship was going. So that leads us to the uh, idea that the historical critical approach does mean that you have to reconsider a kind of long-held traditionalist or traditional ideas. And from that standpoint, it can be challenging to believers. But I think it is something that is necessary. Um, The next point is that it is true that the historical critical approach is not a purely neutral enterprise. Um, It comes with its own presuppositions. And that's where some traditionalist scholars will push back and say that we should reject the historical critical method based on those distinctly Western preconceptions. I don't agree with that, but that is a critique used against the historical critical method. So the historical critical method has a history in the West. It is a product of the Enlightenment. Um, What's interesting, though, is that the historical critical method didn't arise out of a purely secular tradition. Instead, it was many liberal theologians operating out of the church who, or biblical scholars, many of them were Protestants, actually, and then later on Catholics. who were trying to understand what the Bible meant in its original to its original audience. From that sense, it was actually a distinctly religious endeavor. These believers wanted to know what did the Bible mean to its original audience so that they could be faithful to that original uh, sense of the Bible. And so from that perspective, they were looking for what is the original sense of the Bible, what is the intended sense, the historical sense, the literal sense, and what is the plain sense. This all diverges from traditional approaches to the Bible, which would often, for example, engage in allegoresis or um, spiritual meanings of the text. Uh, They wanted to know what did the text mean to its actual first audience. And so that's very different than what the traditional orthodoxy, uh, how they would view the text. So in that sense, it's kind of interesting that the historical critical method starts from a very kind of literal or even literalistic approach. They want to know what is the text literally saying. Now, I do think there's a difference between taking a text literally and taking it literalistically. Um, That's a distinction that must be made. Literalistically means that you apply the text um, without awareness of the changed social historical circumstances. So that's not what a historical critical scholar needs to advocate. But the first step is to understand what does the text mean in its original context before you decide how to apply it in its new context. Um, All right. So again, to reiterate, most of the initial uh, historical critical scholars were biblical scholars themselves, uh, usually liberal Christians. This was, for example, Lessing, Trelch, uh, uh, Boltman, Rudolf Boltman, um, etc. And it arose with that, again, literal exegesis in mind, and as such was linked to the Reformation. So you have the Reformation, Protestant Reformation, and that allows historical critical scholarship to arise as well. Um, Now, these liberal theologians did have a discomfort with miracles, and that's going to be important because the historical critical method kind of presupposes that uh, you kind of go away from that supernatural approach uh, where you explain things by miracles, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, 
Now, the Catholic Church itself uh, was very hesitant to accept the historical critical method and actually condemned it as a heresy for a long period of time. And there was only a grudging acceptance into the in the 20th century. Um, so initially, there was a condemnation of this doctrine of the modernists. So liberal theologians who were using the historical critical method were often dubbed modernists um, and were condemned. But in Vatican II, which is in the 20th mid 20th century, there is finally an acknowledgement that the historical critical method is something that even the church needs to embrace. However, they still push back against what they call extreme revisionism. And this is, I think, the approach that modern Muslims should take, which is a balanced approach, which is to say that we need to embrace the historical critical method, um, even though we can push back against the extreme revisionists. All right. Um, so what were kind of the factors that led to needing this historical critical method when it comes to the Bible? Well, there was certain literary reasons, scientific reasons, and historical reasons. As far as the literary reasons, um, these scholars, biblical scholars, noticed certain inconsistencies in the biblical text. For example, they noticed doublets or triplets, where the same passage was repeated in multiple times, and then there were certain divergences between these uh, repetitions. That called for an explanation, because if this was simply the word of God, why would these kind of discrepancies be in the text? Then there were certain scientific issues, for example, geological findings, um, archaeology. Archeolo um, there was issues of um, time scale. Were we going to take the Bible that it was only, uh, it's talking about humanity starting 5,000, 6,000 years ago. What about the flood? Is that something that's scientifically possible? Um, and then, of course, human evolution with uh, Darwin was a big um shock to many Christians and cause them to reassess the Bible. And finally, there are historical reasons, and that is that is really where the archaeology comes in. Uh, did the Exodus really happen, for example, etc. So all of these things le led these biblical scholars to reassess the Bible, move away from a, uh, you know, kind of a supernatural reading of the text and go towards a more naturalistic approach. Finally, there was the move from kind of a naturalization. So initially, miracles in the Bible were naturalized. And we see the similar phenomenon happening in the Islamic world, where a certain figures such as Sayyid Ahmad Khan in South Asia, Sir Sayyid, uh, kind of naturalized miracles. But now uh, there was this move from naturalization to the acceptance that uh, the Bible is a literary text and therefore uses mythology. And mythology here is used in the academic sense of the term, not in the kind of pejorative way of being untrue. Um, finally, I'll get into certain principles of the historical critical method. The first is, for example, uh, the principle of analogy. This is the idea that people in the past uh, are pretty similar to us in certain key ways. Um, so they may have differences in their social historical context, but we can agree that human beings are in some way the same no matter where they are. This is very different than a traditional or traditionalist approach, which kind of believes in a sacred time and sacred place. For example, in Islam, there is the in traditionalist Islam, there is the idea that the Prophet's companions were a special generation, and therefore they didn't act the way you and I did. They didn't, for example, lie against the Prophet. They didn't attribute false things to the Prophet. Um, they were actually, there's actually this idea of adala of the companions, that is the rectitude of the companions. And that allows us to take transmissions that are attributed to them without even inquiring about whether they were trustworthy and reliable. Um, this is very different uh, from the historical critical method, which says that, well, people are pretty much the same no matter which generation they are, and that they would have incentives to not just fabricate, but sometimes misremember things. And so that's where the historical critical method is different. Now, I, as a Muslim, look at the traditional sources and see that within the sources themselves, there's all sorts of indications that we should be skeptical of this idea that somehow all of the companions were not, you know, were completely flawless uh, in this aspect. Uh, we have reasons to believe that they accused each other, you know, they even fought each other, they uh, fabricated things against each other. There's even companions accusing other companions of fabricating things. So I think there's all sorts of reasons to push back against this idea. Uh, which is a distinctly religious idea. Um, there is the uh, principle of correlation, the criterion of embarrassment or dissimilarity. I'm not going to get into all of these, but just talk about those that kind of differ from traditionalist uh, conceptions. So the criterion of embarrassment and the similar uh, criterion of dissimilarity uh, 
is the idea that when we look back at the historical sources, if we see something that kind of diverges from orthodoxy, that kind of raises the probability that that might go back to an earlier time and is therefore probably more historical. The reason for that is why else would somebody report that? If it goes against orthodoxy, they really wouldn't want to report that. And so we have reason to believe that that actually did happen. And so that's a tool of uh, historical critical scholars uh, that they can use uh, to judge and weigh different pieces of evidence. Um, and then there is, as I said, a certain anti-supernaturalism that is um, a disbelief in miracles. Um, now, I would say this is kind of shocking to many Muslims. However, uh, I would say that the Islamic tradition itself, um, if you look at the Islamic, the classical Islamic philosophers, they also went in the same direction. They either naturalized miracles or they allegorized miracles. Um, and so that is not something strange to the Islamic tradition. Uh, and I think we do have to wonder why, for example, in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, the, when it talks about the Prophet Muhammad and uh, miracles, the, actually the pagans are pushing him to uh, perform a miracle and he's reticent to do, to do that. And the Quran actually explains that why he's not doing that. That's an indication that he didn't do miracles. Um, so I think that's something that we should think about. Um, and finally, um, there is a bracketing, bracketing out of inspiration. That is, um, you can still believe that the a text is divinely inspired, but when you're actually doing your analysis, you're kind of bracketing that off um, and you're engaging in a more kind of scientific enterprise when you're uh, understanding the text. Um, now, coming back to the idea of anti-supernaturalism, there's also uh, a criticism of, or a use of historical anachronisms. Uh, that is to say, a historical anachronism is, for example, if you see a hadith, like we saw this during the Gulf War, there was a hadith that was kind of prophesizing the rise of Saddam Hussein or something along those lines. Well, we know that that hadith, quote unquote, that was you know just spread on emails, um, email chains, is not historical because it mentions something that happened way after the death of the prophet. Um, and then we can even use that to date that uh, hadith. We know that it probably happened after the start of the Gulf War because it's mentioning these events. So sco historical scholars can use historical critical scholars can use uh, historical anachronisms to date texts and judge if they actually do go back to the people who actually who were reported to have said them. And this is the reason, uh, for example, that historical critical scholars in general, most of them, have actually judged that the Quran does indeed go back to the Prophet Muhammad. Fred Donner, even before the kind of manuscript evidence came forward, which it did, um, it actually showed, uh, he actually showed or argued that the Quran does go back to the Prophet Muhammad because it's bereft of the historical anachronisms that beset, for example, the Hadith tradition. The Hadith tradition is full of historical anachronisms, and therefore we should be more skeptical of it as compared to the Quran. Now, a traditionalist Muslim will argue back that the a uh, prophet was a prophet, and therefore he prophesied, and so therefore the historical critical method is problematic from that aspect. Well, you could argue that, but I think you should think about the difference between the Quran and the Hadith when it comes to that. The Quran is devoid of these kind of prophecies, this kind of fortune telling. There's only one possible prophecy in it, which is talking about the Romans vanquishing the Persians, but even that one is debatable. Aside from that, the Quran doesn't talk about any of those uh, things that happen after the prophet's death, including all of the sectarian controversies that happen, the political turmoil, um, the religious issues that came up afterward. It's devoid of those topics, which actually lends us to believe that it does actually go back to the prophet and that it was a closed text very early on. Otherwise, the incentive would have just been too great and early Muslims would have attributed, would have tried to put those kind of things into what became the Quran. Because we don't see that, we can say that the Quran was very early. On the other hand, that's not the case when it comes to much of the Hadith. Um, so that is in a nutshell what the historical critical method is. That's definitely not a thorough um, you know, lecture on the topic, but it is just kind of an introduction. Now, I will conclude with just saying that if you really do believe in the Prophet Muhammad and you believe that he brought something, I think we should try to figure out what that was and we shouldn't be worried or scared um, and just go bravely in that direction 
use the historical critical method to help us understand what the Prophet Muhammad brought, um, which is important to us as Muslims. Having said all of that, this doesn't mean that, and one other thing that I think historical critical scholars do, or scholars of religion in, in general, do not believe in what I call the Big Bang uh, theory of religion, in which all of the religion simply came down to the initial founding figure, and then it's reached us kind of in this unbroken chain of transmission, and um, it all goes back to him. I don't think that's how religions form. As a scholar of religion, I know that that's not the case. Rather, uh, religious traditions have a history, and orthodoxy has a history, and that's just how religion is. And I think the Quran itself acknowledges this. So I'm not necessarily saying that we need to restrict our religion to just what the Prophet Muhammad brought. However, I nonetheless think that as a believing Muslim, it is important for us to know what we can ascertain that the Prophet Muhammad brought. And then that might be helpful for us to push back against what we feel are certain uh, negative or unhelpful things that later on develop in the tradition. And that leads me to my work on jihad, where I see this disconnect between what the Prophet Muhammad brought when it, in regards to you know ethics of war and peace and what the medieval exegetes and what orthodoxy developed when it came to the classical doctrine of jihad. And so I use the historical critical method to uh, push back against the kind of medieval uh, view when it comes to war and peace, which kind of argued for offensive jihad. And, and so I see that that's not what the Prophet Muhammad actually called to. And that's from that perspective, I find the historical critical method to be very useful. And this is, again, where I'm kind of co-opting the Western historical critical method to push back even against certain Western or Orientalist conceptions of Islam, which view it as inherently violent, that it started out in violence and that the Prophet Muhammad was some sort of warlord or, um, you know, battle hungry kind of person. So that's where I'm actually calling Western scholars to also be consistent in that aspect. And we'll talk about that in the next episode or our next uh, part. Thank you so much. Um, I'm open to any questions. Sorry for rambling on and on.